Okay, so in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about nuclear fusion. So a couple of key points I want to talk about before we go into more detail. So nuclear fusion occurs to elements with a nuclear number greater than that of 56. So if you look at the binding energy per nucleon curve, we're looking to the right of the maximum side. Those are the elements that can undergo nuclear fission. The other key thing to know, the, a nuclear power plant Obviously, it has the reactor and stuff is all different, very different to a conventional power plant. But in terms of the actual mechanism to generate electricity, it's exactly the same. The energy from your reactor is used to heat water, to form steam, and then, just like in conventional power plants, that spins a turbine, that turns a generator, and you get your electromagnetic induction going on, which is where your electricity comes from. But the the bit we're going to look at today is actually, well, what makes it different to a power plant? What are the key parts of a nuclear reactor? So there are some key words that I'm going to be using, and I just wanted to draw your attention to them, because these are the sorts of words you need to be using in, when you're writing answers about this topic. So you've got fuel rod, moderator, thermal neutrons, control rods, and coolant. And I'll be explaining those step by step as we go through. Okay, so let's talk about the fuel rods. Now, you can have nuclear reactors with different materials like plutonium, and I think I've seen them with thorium, and there are probably lots of others. But the one we're going to focus on is the one with uranium. Now, there are two key isotopes of uranium. There's 235 and 238. And 235 is the one that we want for our nuclear reactor. So this is the one we're after. So, unfortunately a very high percentage of the uranium that actually exists that we mine is this 238 version. So what we do we have is this process called enrichment which you may have heard of from watching the news and that sort of things because this is what's causing so much controversy in places like Iran where they're currently working on technology that allows the enrichment of uranium. Obviously the governments are worried that they're going to use it for atomic bombs, but you also need it for the for it to for produce this 235 uranium, which is what they the, those countries claim they are doing. Now, just out of interest, for nuclear bombs, you need a much higher level of enrichment for it. So, for generally for a nuclear reactor, you have quite low level enrichment. You don't actually have to enrich it that much, but in bombs, the enrichment is uh, quite a scale higher, which is why you'll often hear to people talking about the extent to which they can enrich their uranium and that's what's important. Anyway, let's get back to the fuel rods because what actually happens is inside the reactor you have all the fuel in the form of rods and it's this 235 uranium that's important because inside your reactor this 235 uranium much greater than the 56 which we said was required to undergo fission so the uranium will undergo the process of nuclear fission and it does that by, in, well, basically we initiate the reaction by bombarding it with neutrons. And these neutrons cause the uranium to go past the point of stability and they become very unstable and they will undergo fission. So what you have is you have your neutron going in. You've got your 235 uranium going out and you get lots of different possible products. I'm not going to name a specific one in here, but the key thing is you also get, so you get your product, well, and then you also get three neutrons, which is a very great advantage in this because that means this reaction can initiate three further possible reactions. And this is what's happening inside a, nu inside a nuclear bomb this one reaction initiates three, and those three then initiate nine, and you get this chain reaction going on, and we call that a runaway reaction, because it's basically, you're, you're every reaction you have, you're increasing the number, total number of reactions, and then it gets crazy out of control, and you end up with an atomic bomb. And it's the role of the control rods to prevent this occurring, but I'll get onto that in a little bit. So that's the fuel rods. So let's talk about the moderator. So typically, uh, in reactors, we use something called heavy water. You also come across ones that just use regular water, some that use CO2, 
so obviously you just have regular H2O, you have CO2 and that sort of thing, but they're all trying to do the same thing. And the key thing, the role of the moderator, is to produce thermal neutrons, which I talked about as one of the key words. And the thing, the thing for this is, is for a neutron to initiate fission, it needs to be travelling at quite low speed. If it's going at higher speed, it's not able to induce the fission. And these lower speed neutrons are what we call thermal neutrons. So the, the way we go about getting these thermal neutrons is to introduce a moderator into the reactor. So the fuel rods are completely surrounded by the moderator, so if it's water, that means they're completely surrounded by water. And what they do is they collide with the neutrons, or rather the neutrons more collide with molecules of your moderator. And in that collision, some of the kinetic energy of the neutron is transferred to kinetic energy in your water. So the neutron effectively slows down. And there's a key thing I want to talk about here, and you'll come across it in, in when you were looking at the mechanics sort of stuff, and you'll know that an elastic collision in which is one in which your kinetic energy is conserved and in the collision between the neutron and the moderator the kinetic energy is basically said to be conserved so we describe it as an elastic collision so although the neutron slows down and loses kinetic energy that energy is gained by the moderator so there's no loss of kinetic energy or that's how we model it so we say it's an elastic collision, and that's quite an important thing to know, and I've seen that in a couple of past exam questions, which has really caught people out. So that's the moderator. Next one, coolant. Often this is the same as your moderator, so in reactors that use heavy water or water, or CO2 as their moderator, that is also the coolant. And the role of the coolant is to basically remove heat. So exactly what it sounds like to cool to cool things down, and so how this is done is you use the water you will pipe it round a system, and obviously this water will be have radioact uh, radioactive properties to it. So you don't you're not going to expose that to the outside, but you pass it through a heat exchanger, which gives the heat to some water running in separate pipes so it doesn't get radioactive, which then become that obviously turns into steam and powers the generator but that's done by piping the coolant in this into the heat exchanger and then that other water takes that heat away and that then that's where all the process of generating electricity goes on. But it's quite often you're the same as your moderator. So that's all the details you need to know about that. Probably didn't need a whole page for this, but never mind. Okay, control rods. So like I was saying earlier, to initiate fission you need one neutron, but the fission reaction produces three. So you have the capability to go what's called supercritical, and you basically each reaction causes even more reactions, so it's a runaway reaction. So you have these three stages. You have supercritical, you have critical. And you have subcritical. Okay. So, and we usually phrase it in the form where we say supercritical mass, critical mass, or subcritical mass. You may have heard the phrase critical mass before. And the role of the control rods is to stop the reaction becoming supercritical. Because this is a nuclear bomb, we don't want every one of our power plants to turn into a nuclear bomb. So the control rod's job is basically to remove excess neutrons or absorb neutrons. So they do this by, they're mounted on the reactor and the person operating it can either insert the control rods, they can remove them, they can partially insert them. So they insert them to a level where we achieve this critical mass. And critical mass means that on average every fission produces one neutron. So each fission induces one other fission, which is the ideal state, and that's what we want to get in. 
and by adjusting the control rods we try and get it to, so we absorb enough neutrons so you get the equivalent of one neutron producing fission which reduces one neutron because that's the be the most sustainable method so you get the mo most energy but you're not going super critical and the my person running the reactor can adjust they can remove the control rods if you go subcritical or insert them more if you start to go super critical and in the case of a meltdown they'll whack them all fully into the reactor to try and shut the reaction down and stop any further fission okay so let's talk about waste so inside the power plant obviously we have our fission reaction going on that produces waste products now some of them you can are quite useful cuz you can use them as tracers in medical diagnosis some of the products are even nuclear fuels which can then be further um further undergo fission and release even more energy but you also get some material which is of no use whatsoever so you actually need to dispose of it so there's a couple of stages to disposing it first there's the cooling process so each well, nu nuclear reactor will have what's called cooling ponds and you basically you put the the sorry not control rods the fuel rods into those to cool them down until the temperature falls to a, a safe level so they're no longer really hot and the second stage is storage is as you learned previous in the previous part of the course eat these radioactive materials have a half life and the when you have fission the products of that are radioactive so you need to keep them away because they're very dangerous so you have to store them in incredibly secure sealed containers they're usually underground and lined with lead and concrete and all sorts and you basically just have to wait until the activity of them has reached background radiation level which can take thousands or even millions of years which is a massive downside of the nuclear reactors and that's what makes them so controversial